to talk about Neoplatonism and uh, the problem of Dick's Christianity. I'm going to start with Neoplatonism, and I'm going to move on to a response to the, uh, the critic um, Gabriel McKee, who wrote a book called uh, Pink Beams uh, from the God in the Gutter. And uh, he's a kind of religious studies guy working on Dick, arguing that Dick is ultimately a Christian and not a Gnostic. Um, and uh, if you can't get a hold of uh, McKee's book, you can read uh, our very own Umberto Rossi's uh, excellent review in SF Studies, which is available on the internet. And there's also a link on my blog, so you know, if you can't find it, send me an email, I'll, I'll help you find it. Okay, so what is Neoplatonism? Philip K. Dick was huge into philosophy, right? He loved Plato, um, but he was also interested in this weird guy who we have uh, on the screen, Plotinus, who is uh, correctly or incorrectly seen as the father of this new style of Platonic philosophy called Neoplatonism. Uh, Neoplatonism is considered a, a sort of more spiritual, more religious take on uh, on um, Plato's philosophy, although if you ask Plotinus himself, he would say, well, I'm just working in this tradition of interpretation, it goes all the way back to Plato. I'm telling you what Plato himself really thought. Now, appropriate for a Phil Dickian source, uh, Plotinus is viewed paradoxically uh, by modern philosophical criticism. At the same time, Plotinus is seen as the father of a certain style of mysticism, uh, that becomes Christian mysticism as we know it, uh, the likes of, uh, say, Meister Eckhart, uh, who was also an influence on Dick's mysticism. Uh, the other side of Plotinus is that he is seen, in distinction to the other Neoplatonists who followed him, who were considered to be more magical and kind of far out, uh, Plotinus is seen as the super rational, uh, kind of smart guy. And that, uh, so, Scholars like uh, you know, Bertrand Russell might admire Plotinus for being so rationalistic. It's an interesting paradox, right, that at the same time he's this father of mysticism, but he's seen as this greatest uh, you know, of the late uh, Platonic philosophers in terms of being very lucid and very clear. Okay, so I hope that none of you expected to see a formal academic lecture on Plotinus. That's not what I'm planning to do here. The problem, <laughs> the problem with understanding the influence of Plotinus on Dick is that Dick didn't always really fully understand the, what he was reading in Plotinus. So I'm going to start with two excerpts from interviews that Dick gave late in his life. One of them is uh, with Frank Bertrand great uh, Philip K. Dick fan and internet raconteur. So, Frank asked him, once your interest in philosophy was sparked, how did you pursue this interest? What books did you read? And Dick said, well, you know, I dropped out of college and just did philosophy on my own. You know, there's lots to be said about Dick, the, uh, the autodidact, who was at the same time brilliant and defensive about the fact that he didn't have a college degree. Um, so my main sources, of course, were poets. Let's, let's do a little surprising twist. But, you know, I love Sp Spinoza, Leibniz, and Plotinus. The last influencing me greatly. Okay, so Plotinus is a big influence, right? And I'm going to go over uh, what Dick had to say about Plotinus in the exegesis, uh, which is a crucial, arguably a crucial influence on the way that he understood how to talk about his mystical experiences. All right. But naturally, with Philip K. Dick, there's always a contradiction. So here is the other thing that he said in an interview with our own Greg Rickman. Where I met my downfall was when I tried to read Plotinus. <laughs> he tried and he failed, and this is the reason that he dropped philosophy for a while and moved on to psychology and started reading Carl Jung and stuff like that. There wasn't much available on Plotinus that he could make sense of. He didn't have, uh, he didn't have the text in uh, convenient English translation. He couldn't make heads or tails of this stuff. It's only until much later when he begins to understand the influence of Neoplatonism on the style of Christianity that was so important to him that we see uh, Dick becoming uh, sort of Neoplatonist, maybe a, a Platinian in, in some ways. Okay, so let's look at 
a few examples of what Dick has to say about Plotinus and the exegesis. I'm sorry, do you have uh, years for those? Uh, Plotinus, uh, a few centuries after the birth of Christ, the third century. Um, and uh, Neoplatonism is really a movement that goes back a century before Plotinus. Philosophers like uh, his teacher Ammonius, uh, Numenius, and the whole uh, Middle Platonic tradition, which you can read about in the excellent studies of Professor John Dillon, uh, D-I-L-L-O-N. Uh, but I, I, can't, I can't say much more, and uh, my argument is that we don't really need to understand too much about Neoplatonism because it's not important to get the details right. Uh, what we need to understand is the way that Dick made use of Plotinus and the kind of creative misunderstandings uh, that led him to, to see himself as, as a Neoplatonist or maybe not, and, and we'll see why. Um, so, at 4103 in the exegesis, there's a really interesting discussion of the other. Now, Dick thinks of God in this moment as wholly other, right? And there's this big problem of how do we approach the other. And this is a big problem in 20th century philosophy. If you read people like Levinas, who talked about how Western culture is sort of uh, diseased with an allergy to the other. Uh, now, I think that, uh, that, that Philip K. Dick really had some important insight here when he started looking at what Plotinus is doing and the way that we look at others. And I think that this is just one of the most beautiful lines um, and the exegesis, he says, the other is not any one thing found in any particular place. It's a quality in all things. It shines through them back at us. We see it and it sees back as a dialogue. I'm reminded of something Terence McKenna said, where if you can't have an I-thou relationship with it, you know, it's not an other. It's not, you know, a divine entity. Um, like Plotinus' concept of concentric rings of emanation, and I'll explain that in a minute, we encounter our others in gradually increasing intensity and clarity. They become clearer to us continually. This might not be 100% accurate as a philosophical reading of Plotinus, but I think that this is an extremely interesting example of applied Neoplatonism. How we can use the Neoplatonic theory of emanation to think about the problem that David Gill began our conference with, right? This idea that Dick is all about watching people learning to care about each other, learning to communicate about what's important to us. And then he goes on to say, you know, uh, the article says that it remains speculation, whatever article he's talking about, this orthogonal time, right, this concept that he is simultaneously an ancient Christian named Thomas and the empire never ended, you, you all know the drill. Um, <laughs> It wasn't speculation, it was a real experience that I had, and it was a real experience that Plotinus had. Now, Plotinus was famous for two sort of, uh, sort of supernatural experiences, one of them which I won't discuss. He went to a diviner, and instead of having a guardian spirit, it turns out he had a god for his guardian spirit. There's a great podcast called God is uh, My Co-Pilot um, about Plotinus, or a god is my co-pilot. Right. The second thing is that Plotinus is said to have had a mystical, transcendent experience of the One, which is sort of the, uh, the god of the Neoplatonists. Um, although the Neoplatonists were polytheists, they were at the same time monists, and they believed that there was sort of one source of everything. So what is this Plotinian One, and what is this concept of concentric rings of emanation? Plotinus theorized that the cosmos has three levels to it. The first level is known as the One. The One is transcendent and uh, sort of untouchable. There's, there's nothing that we can really say about it, which is ironic because he wrote a thousand pages about it. Um, and then there is level two, and level two, arguably the, the more important in terms of Dickian studies, is the level of intellect, the level of uh, the intelligible world, which Dick gets a ton of mileage out of thinking about the logos, thinking about the universe as a giant mind, thinking about the way physicists are saying now that the universe is all information, it's not really stuff, it's not really substances, it's just this play of information. And so Dick thinks that he had a mystical experience similar to the one that Plotinus had. That he was able to see the, the one 
shining through the, the multiplicity of all things. We've got another quote down below where he's talking about these uh, rings of uh, concentric uh, actualization. Plotinus visualized the third level of soul as being contained within the level of the intelligible, which is contained within the one. And uh, this is a way that Dick felt that he could solve this problem that he had. You know, what is invading from the outside? Um, how is it that... Uh, that we can have this experience of, uh, of the one when we're living in Plato's cave, right? Um, and so there's this kind of transcendental aspect of, uh, of Plotinus that's very important to Dick in the way that he thinks about things. Okay, so here is one of Dick's greatest mistakes as a Plotinian interpreter. Now, Dick believed that he had discovered something kind of important about Plotinus that before Plotinus, the spiritual world was envisioned by philosophers like Plato and Pythagoras as spatial. And the journey of the soul was an ascent through these different layers of the cosmos. You know, you've got to go through the, the crystal sphere of Mercury first, and then you're going to go through the sphere of Jupiter, etc., etc., right? Ascending and ascending through a literal physical space. Uh, now, this isn't really correct. Plotinus is working in a spiritual tradition that, that really does go all the way to Plato. And the spirituality of Plotinus is, is very similar to the spirituality of Plato. I mean, there's arguments that we can make uh, if you want to go to a you know, philosophy postdoctoral program. Uh, but uh, the point is, Plotinus did not invent this idea of transcendence. Right? Anyway, so Dick thought that he did. Um, and so we've got to kind of just run with it, right? And uh, so Dick has this idea of Plotinus. It's not entirely accurate, but it's an interesting idea, right? That Plotinus discovered in his emanation system of the one, the intellect and the soul, is a way of kind of explaining how we can see uh, a mystical experience as a non-spatial journey. And so here in this quote, Dick is arguing that Plotinus made mystical experience available in this lifetime. We can kind of touch the one. If we do the right contemplative exercises, which you can read about in the exegesis, uh, I'm sorry, the Aeneads of Plotinus. Now, the Aeneads of Plotinus is this huge text, uh, and one of the things that's going on, it's not just a discursive argument, but there are also sort of uh, exercises that you do. Contemplative exercises, thinking about the one. And uh, we imagine that Plotinus in lecture was sort of, uh, you know, getting into a trance with his students and reading commentaries on Plato, but with the idea of sort of reaching up and kind of experiencing the one and experiencing the, the platonic forms in, in a very direct way. So that's what he's talking about here. And this idea of the, the basic error in Western philosophy that Plotinus corrected. Well, yeah, I'm not sure what to make of this, but... Uh, in this ontological view of the journey, rather than spatial, it's levels of being, not spatial differences. When you get to the level of intellect, you have more being than things at the level of soul do. And when things emanate from the one, they sort of lose being. This explains why we're all stuck down in the trash stratum, by the way. And uh, this is an important aspect of uh, Dick's Gnosticism as well, because Plotinus was a great critic of the Gnostics, and Plotinus had a severe bone to pick with the Gnostics' view of matter. The idea that we're stuck in this material universe that is kind of a lie, and that matter is this principle of ultimate evil, right? Which is very important to Dick's concept of the uh, black iron prison, right? So Plotinus anticipates Heidegger, okay? <laughs> Um, we heard earlier, if you were in track A, you know, that uh, Dick was so interested in the existential uh, psychology, the idea of Dasein, and uh, so here he's reading the Neoplatonists, and of course Heidegger had a huge interest in the Neoplatonists. This is a, a topic that uh, I, I have no expertise, so I couldn't really go too far into it. The upper realm is spatially here, not there. The whole cosmos is kind of present, and, and the one is present, the intellectual is present at the level of soul, because soul is contained within these larger uh, concentric circles of emanation. All right, I see I'm running low on time, so I'm going to just gloss over these last few things. You can go to my blog to read these. 
I've come close to Christian Platonism, he thinks. And I'm close, if not congruent, to Plotinus's Neoplatonism and the possibility of having this mystical experience of the one and the forms. Okay, how does this relate to the problem of Dick's Christianity? There's another interesting place in the exegesis where Dick says, you know, I think that I've come back before Christianity to a sort of Gnostic, Hermetic, Neoplatonism. I'm not going to unpack Gnostic and Hermetic. The point is that he conflates them all with Neoplatonism. He sees these late antique mystical philosophical movements as sort of all of a piece. So, is Christianity congruent with Neoplatonism, or does this Neoplatonic thing that Dick has discovered, which confirms the insights of his mystical experiences, does this destroy Christianity? Dick was haunted by this idea. I think he was kind of horrified by it, that um, although he had this very Christian background, and Gabriel McKee has argued that in the final analysis, Dick is ultimately a Christian and not a Gnostic, um, I think that Dick was very worried about this problem. In the same way that he was worried that maybe he was a schizophrenic, I think he was worried that maybe he was a heretic. <laughs> or maybe he was a magician. At other times he thinks, I'm, I'm, I'm getting in touch with the ancient magic of the Magi. There's a great letter to Ursula Le Guin where he rants about Zoroastrianism and he was on that. Or is that a letter to Claudia Bush? I forget. There's a whole trip where he's on uh, Zoroastrianism. Okay? So... What, is, uh, what does Gabriel McKee have to say? Why does he argue that we should privilege Christianity over Gnosticism when we interpret Dick? Well, and I agree with Umberto Rossi here. I'm very reliant on his critique of McKee in that nice review. I agree that uh, McKee um, seems to misapply the principle that he applies to Gnosticism. He says, well, you know, the problem with Gnosticism is that well, you know, there's no one thing that can really explain Dick, right? He's just such a varied writer. He has all of these, all of these things going on. There's so many complications, so many pieces of the puzzle. You know, that you really can't say that Gnosticism is the one thing that explains everything. Really, it's Christianity. Reminds me of uh, John Stewart, you know, critiquing, uh, critiquing uh, the, the Tea Party or, or Fox News approaches where Fox News says... You know, look at what, uh, look at what uh, happened to Obama, right? They, uh, there's this video, and you shouldn't use videos to critique Mitt Romney, but now Obama's getting caught up in one of those videos, too. Um, so, McKee says that, you know, you really can't use one thread to, you know, pull everything together. But then he goes on to say, as if he hadn't made this argument a moment ago, that we need to see Dick as ultimately a Christian, I agree with McKee that Christianity played a very huge role, right? Dick is haunted by his Christianity. He's a Christian all of his life. It uh, you know, plays a role in his donations to the uh, anti-abortion cause, for example. I mean, there's just so much evidence that we can't ignore. There is no account of Philip K. Dick uh, that we can construct that doesn't take into account his deep um, Christianity. Um, and I think it's really misreading Dick to see him as a skeptic or to see him as, uh, you know, uh, indulging in, in all of these multiple possibilities when really he, uh, he wants to prove this Christian insight that he's had. Now, I think the other problem with McKee is that he doesn't see Dick's Gnosticism as coming from his Christianity in some sense. Gnosticism is really an alternate version of Christianity. It's not necessarily to be seen as the opposite of Christianity. And I think that one of the reasons that Dick was really haunted by this, um, I mean, we see them as contradictions, but they have a lot in common. And I think that Dick's adventures in mysticism, esotericism, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, all of these wonderful, strange, magical philosophies, um, can be explained as coming from the same place that his Christianity comes from, in some sense. Um, it's not that Dick explores Gnosticism because he's anti-Christian, um, but he's trying to figure out what Christianity really means. And at some times he thinks that Gnosticism has really got the right idea. And in another place he says, no, Plotinus was right and the Gnostics were wrong. So Plotinus helps him 
And you can read Plotinus versus the Gnostics and the Aeneids. You can read plenty of great uh, explanations of this argument. It was a big deal. Dick probably had access to an Encyclopedia Britannica summary of Plotinus' argument against the Gnostics. And so at a certain point he says, oh, you know, maybe Plotinus uh, was right, right? Maybe the Gnostics were wrong. And uh, down below, where do we have it? At a certain point he's thinking about Ubik. Where is it? Uh, I can't find it, I don't have time. Um, he's thinking about Ubik and he says, you know, maybe I'm not really dead. Maybe it's just that Plotinus was right. So, interesting stuff. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, cut it short here. Give it up for Eric Davis.